Well, we're talking about Johann Gerhardt and the call to the ministry and why it's necessary before performing pastoral functions. Um, one of the things that I've been really interested in is when we talk about what the call is, what did that actually mean for Gerhardt? Um, a lot of times we come from a Missouri Synod background with a very congregationalistic sort of a, a background where we think a lot of times our, our basic default position is to think about either the call of the congregation or else a call by bishops or something like that as like the two basic options. So it's interesting to just step back a little bit and let's, let's look a little bit at what Gerhardt actually means when he's talking about the call and the call process. The sixth volume of Gerhardt's Lotzi Theologici, containing the commonplaces on the ecclesiastical ministry and on political magistracy, were first, uh, first published in 1619. And it's interesting to, to keep in mind what was going on with Gerhardt at the time. The years leading up to 1619 were Gerhardt's first years as a professor of theology at Jena. Yet he had been active in the pastoral ministry for 10 years before he came to Jena in 1616. On June 5th, 1606, he was called to be pastor and superintendent of Heldborg by Duke Johann Casimir of Coburg. So there it's the Duke who called him to his position. Four years later, in December 1610, Gerhardt had made his report of an inspection of the churches and schools of Heldborg. That's a visitation process there. And he had come to conclusions about how they needed to be improved. Having successfully carried out this task, he was given the duty of conducting a general inspection of all of Johann Casimir's lands in Thuringia and Franconia in 1613. By 1615, Gerhardt had become the general superintendent, which is the functional equivalent of a bishop in Coburg, and had written a church ordinance, or a church order is how we often call them, which came to be called the Church Ordinance of Johann Casimir, and it was later published in 1626. A lot of times those church ordinances were published under the name of the prince, whoever put it into effect, but it was Johann Gerhardt that actually wrote it. And the basis for that he wrote it, he basically was borrowing from other church ordinances of the time, especially the, the 1580 Electoral Saxon Church Order, which had been written by Jacob Andrei, as far as I understand. This church ordinance that Gerhardt edited and, and compiled and wrote included chapters on many of the same topics that appeared in his commonplace on the ecclesiastical ministry, such as the call, examination, ordination, investiture, kind of like installation, I suppose, and pastoral duties. Of course, during his ministry, he had already begun writing his theological commonplaces. A church ordinance in, the early, in early Lutheranism was both more and less than what we have in the LCMS handbook. It was more in that it usually included a detailed statement of faith to which the ministers had to adhere. This was the body of doctrine, the corpus doctrinae. You can see a good example of it at the beginning of the 1569 church ordinance written by Martin Chemnitz and Jacob Andrei and published as Church Order in the Chemnitz's Works series from CPH. In Gerhardt's church ordinance, instead of a body of doctrine, he explains that God's word is the only rule of doctrine and preaching. He explains which ones are the symbolical books of our church and he explains how the writings of the church fathers are to be regarded. Then, Gerhardt's church ordinance has chapters on the call, examination, ordination, investiture, preaching, catechization, ceremonies, confession and absolution, communion, baptism, marriage, visiting the sick, funerals, pastoral ethics, pastoral remuneration, duties of the laity, church and school visitation, the office of church superintendents, excommunication, church discipline, alms, lay leaders, hospitals, sacristans, and marriage cases. Quite a bit more than what we have in the LCMS handbook, but also LCMS handbook covers maybe some other things that this doesn't. Then after that, there's some more. In Latin, there are school regulations because there were uh, Latin speaking schools. 
Gerhardt was not original in this. He basically took two previously existing church ordinances and edited them for the situation in Coburg. So the first part that we want to talk about right here is on church government. In Lutheran Germany, following the first Saxon visitation of churches in 1527 by Luther and Melanchthon and some others, a system of church polity soon developed which was centered around superintendents and consistories. In 1527, amid the visitation, it became clear to Luther, Melanchthon, and others that pastors and people would need continued supervision to deal with the large number of questions and problems that they had inherited from years of false doctrine and neglect. For this purpose, the government, the civil government that is, instituted superintendents to whom the pastors could turn. However, these superintendents often felt ill-equipped to deal with the confused legal matters, especially marriage cases. Therefore, the superintendents would refer the difficult cases to the Visitation Commission, or even to the Prince's Advisory Council, his cabinet. These kinds of cases were very unusual for the cabinet of a prince to deal with. Theologians such as Eustace Jonas, therefore, recommended the formation of consistories to deal with such matters. A consistory in Latin was consistorium, consistorium. In classical Rome, this meant the place where the emperor's council met, the emperor's cabinet. In Lutheran Germany, the consistory was similarly a board of theologians and lawyers appointed by the Christian magistrate, such as the elector of Saxony, to deal with oversight of the churches in the realm. In 1539, a consistory began its work in Wittenberg. It was similar to a combination of what we would call a board of directors and a board of adjudications, kind of both of those in one. The cases it decided dealt with marriage, disputes over church property, supervision of life, doctrine, and conduct of pastors, protecting pastors from injustice, and the exercise of the major ban, excommunication. This placement of church matters under consistories was widely adopted in all evangelical territories in Germany. At the Reformation, the churches of Electoral Saxony were divided up among a number of different dioceses. So the, the formerly existing dioceses in the Roman Catholic Church didn't overlap with, I mean, they overlap, but not like 100% with the borders of Electoral Saxony. Instead, Electoral Saxony had um, a couple of different dioceses within it. You might remember that Luther sent the 95 Theses in 1517 to Albrecht of Mainz, his bishop. But Mainz was outside of Electoral Saxony. So as the Reformation in Saxony proceeded, and it was necessary to make changes to reform the church, the Elector of Saxony, with Luther and his Wittenberg team, were not able to place any Lutherans into office as bishops, since the bishops of the churches over Electoral Saxony had their cathedrals and their residence outside of Electoral Saxony. Therefore, the churches of Electoral Saxony were reformed, ignoring the Roman Catholic bishops. And in the treatise of the, on the power and primacy of the Pope, Melanchthon showed why it was legitimate for the Lutheran churches to call and ordain pastors without bishops. In 14, 1541, however, there was an opportunity to put a Lutheran into office as a bishop. The little diocese of Naumburg was completely within the boundaries of Electoral Saxony. In a number of official opinions that will be published in 2018, I think it's 2018, in Luther's work 61, Luther, Melanchthon, Bugenhagen, and Caspar Kruziger gave advice to the elector on how to go about reforming the diocese of Naumburg into an evangelical Lutheran episcopacy. In 1542, Nikolaus von Amsdorf was elected by the cathedral chapter, which at the time was a committee of noblemen who sat on that committee in Naumburg. He was elected by them and was ordained to this office by Luther and Bugenhagen with the imposition of hands. So obviously Luther and Bugenhagen weren't all that uh, concerned about having uh, apostolic succession of ordinations from other bishops, but they did want to keep an Episcopal form of church government. Luther's subsequent writing, Model of How to Consecrate a True Christian Bishop, 
will be published in Luther's work 61 as well. However, this Lutheran episcopate was only an episode. After Luther's death and the defeat of the small Caldic League, it became impossible for Amsdorf to remain in office. In at least one place in northern Germany, however, at least one place, if not more, a Lutheran episcopacy remained into the 17th century. However, this was a place where the bishop, under, even under the Roman Catholic Church, had always been a nobleman, mostly untrained in theology and unconcerned with exercising the biblical duties of supervising doctrine. It was an ecclesiastical prince. Even though there were Lutheran bishops around, even in the 17th century, the actual effect was not much different than having a prince in charge of the church. And really, if you look at Albrecht of Mainz and all these other Roman Catholic bishops, commonly, the common practice was that it was always a nobleman who became a bishop. So it wasn't a big change to have the secular Christian magistrates take over the, the administration of the church. It had always been noblemen doing it, and now it was going to continue to be noblemen doing it, but noblemen who had a pure confession of the gospel instead of the, uh, the false papistic confession. So in my limited research on this topic, I found that German Lutherans were blocked by both Roman Catholics and by their own nobility from retaining an episcopacy in which a trained theologian and pastor would function as a bishop. In, in essence, the church government in Lutheran Germany didn't change that much. Now, there was something interesting here also. The model of church government by superintendent and consistory very much resembles, I think, the model of a bishop with his cathedral chapter. It is what the Lutherans were used to coming out of the Middle Ages, and so I am not surprised to find that they continued it. In fact, Gerhardt regarded the office of a church superintendent to be, in fact, the office of bishop. And so what you do find going on here is, whereas the Roman Catholic bishops had been mostly noblemen who administered all the affairs of the church, what you find is that, okay, the the Lutherans were trying to have the noblemen continue to administer the day-to-day -day secular business kinds of uh, issues regarding the church, but to have then a trained theologian and pastor be the superintendent to deal with the spiritual side of things. And that, that is a common goal that just about all the Lutheran theologians had. But that... that that office of a superintendent of churches was in fact seen as an equivalent to the office of bishop. In On the Ministry Part 2, Gerhardt writes in paragraph 231, the word bishops, episcopi, is taken from episcopane, which means to oversee, according to the interpretation of Augustine. Therefore, a bishop to the Latins is the same as an inspector, or as we say in the church today, a superintendent. Ambrose translates it as superinspector, Jerome as superintendens. In the holy writings of the New Testament, the word bishop is assigned in general to all who perform the teaching office in the church. For since they have been placed as bishop by the Holy Spirit to feed the church of God, Acts 20:28, 20, and since they are commanded to feed the flock that is in their charge, exercising oversight, 1 Peter 5, 2, therefore they are rightly and deservedly called bishops because of this overseeing of the flock entrusted to them. However, to nurture good order and concord in the church, there formerly was established the sort of distinction among those pastors that some were entrusted not only with oversight over the flock entrusted to them, but also over other pastors and presbyters. As a result, it happened that the title bishop was attributed in a specific sense to those pastors who had the oversight over other teachers. Again, in responding to the charge that Lutherans hold to the Arian heresy, that's not Arian, that's A-E-R-I-A-N, the Arian heresy, which taught that there is no difference between bishop and presbyter, Gerhardt says, None of us says there is no difference between bishop and presbyter. Instead, we acknowledge that in order to encourage ecclesiastical good order and harmony, it is useful to preserve the distinction between bishops and presbyters in the church. Gregorius de Valentia, a Roman Catholic writer, acknowledges that we establish such a separation. Gregorius writes, 
All Protestants admit at least three grades of ministers, namely bishops, whom they call superintendents, as having the care of church discipline, presbyters, whom they call ministers of the word and sacraments, and deacons, who diligently assist superintendents and pastors in the administration of the sacraments and in other duties. Gerhardt continues by quoting Bellarmine, Robert Bellarmine, his great opponent. Bellarmine said, Chemnitz teaches that there are only three true orders, bishops, whom they gladly call pastors, presbyters, whom they call elders or teachers or ministers of the word, and deacons. Gerhardt then sums up and, and uh, adds one last comment. Yet if we distinguish the order of bishops from presbyters, we are surely saying that there is some difference between bishop and presbyter. This does not, however, mean that Gerhardt viewed bishops in the same way as his Roman Catholic opponents did. You can see the great difference between the two views, not only in On the Ministry, but also in the book, The, uh, the Commonplace on the Church, where Gerhardt disproves the Roman Catholic doctrine of an unbroken succession of bishops stretching from Peter to his day. Nevertheless, Gerhardt holds that Lutherans at his day did hold to episcopacy, even in Germany, where they were not called bishops. The word superintendent was used to focus on the oversight of doctrine and perhaps also to avoid the legal meanings of the word bishop in Germany, especially after the, the, the legal agreements of the mid-1500s in which um, the, the, uh, the rights of bishops, the secular rights of, you know, these uh, territorial rights of bishops were transferred over to the secular princes. So you couldn't really call your church superintendent a bishop, and so they had to come up with a different word. Yeah. Were you going to spend some time on, on that particular document of his disproving the apostolic succession? No, no, not not today, not today. But it's great. It's a great read. It's in on the church. I highly recommend that book, on um, the uh, the locus on the church. That'll that'll have to be for next time, right? So the next thing we want to talk about is the call process. The call process in Gerhardt's district, Coburg, was handled mainly by the consistory and the superintendent. Candidates were not permitted to request a particular parish, much less were they allowed to give bribes to obtain it. That's specifically stated. The fact that that prohibition had to be mentioned means that it must have been regarded as a danger and may have happened. I, that's usually what happens. I don't think you'll find any of our LCMS documents saying that uh, no bribes are allowed because that just is not, you know, it's not a very common sort of occurrence. If a pastor was suffering poverty or other troubles, he should tell the consistory, the ordinary visitors, or his superintendent. And the ordinary visitors would mean the... Uh, like the circuit visitor and, his, and the other uh, members of that visitor commission or committee, I should say. These people then, along with the patron of the parish, would, if the pastor was having some kinds of trouble in the, in, the, in the parish, they would look into a translocation for the pastor. The patron of the parish was often a nobleman whose ancestors had put up the money to build the church or endow the parish pastor's salary. So those patrons continued to retain rights. Now, the call process itself ran something like this. Those who have the right of patronage in a vacant parish should nominate suitable persons to the consistory. This has to happen so that the consistory can examine him in person before he gives a trial sermon before the patron and perhaps also before the congregation. If the candidates are found qualified, pure doctrine and upright life, testified by references, then they are presented to the congregation. The congregation then has the right to refuse a proposed new pastor, but they have to give reasons. If the reasons are trivial, coming from misunderstanding or ignorance, their refusal can be overruled by the consistory. In this case, the congregation would be instructed by the superintendent before the new pastor begins. Now, why would the congregation's wishes not be followed in this case? And Gerhardt um, answers that. He says, because it is not edifying to let a congregation continue in error, ignorance, or obstinacy. 
wouldn't fly in the Missouri Synod. Theology students, SEM grads we might say, are not allowed normally to take over a pastorate right away. First, they must serve as school teachers or, quote, in the diaconate. This is so that he can learn the rituals of the church, the ritus ecclesiae. As a deacon, and when I say deacon, throw out whatever you think about deacons currently and just listen to how he describes it, okay? As a deacon, he would preach, give instruction, and visit the sick. Kind of sounds like a vicar to me. With testimonies from his superintendents and pastor, he would later be called to a parish pastorate. Yet before the call to the parish pastorate, he would need to be examined again. This examination consisted of a trial sermon and an inspection of his progress in learning and reading, or his lack thereof. The consistory carries out this examination and keeps records in a book of men waiting for a call. The particu a particularly gifted man, equipped for preaching and well acquainted with the rituals of the church, however, may skip that diaconate period. But the decision on this lies with the consistory. Not only was this examination required before the first call, that examination was required also at subsequent calls to other parishes. But it wasn't just left up to the consistory to use any kind of examination that they wanted. That, too, would be open to abuse. There was a specified list of points that the consistory had to examine. Is his doctrine pure? Is he diligent in studying scripture and reading other books? What kind of voice does he have? What is his health status? Does he lead a morally upright life? How old is he? And has he subscribed the Book of Concord? The trial sermon was also necessary. Here the consistory would pick a text, and the man being examined must then give a short sermon on it. The consistory should pay attention not just to his oratory, but also to his pronunciation and gestures. If the examination is a failure, but the candidate is young and there is hope that he will improve, he should be sent back to the academy or the university for further study. Then there was a trial sermon before the congregation. The superintendent presents the candidate to the congregation, the candidate preaches, and afterward the superintendent asks the parishioners if they will have him. So from this, you see that the common people as a whole did not have a choice between several candidates, as in a U.S. election. One candidate was put before them, and after listening to him, they could accept him or refuse him. You might be interested to learn that even to this day, the call process in our sister church in Germany, the Selk, is similar to this. The Kirchenleitung, which is similar to a consistory there, but they are elected to the church, uh, to that consistory. They're elected by the church instead of being appointed by the secular government. That Kirchenleitung presents one possible pastor to a vacant congregation, and the congregation decides yes or no. After the candidate has been cleared by the consistory and is accepted by the laity, he still had to receive confirmation by the prince in Coburg. So off to Coburg, the candidate went and there preached yet another trial sermon. After being given the okay by the prince, ordination and or installation followed. Gerhardt's church ordinance states also that repeated examination was also required for preachers who had been serving for less than eight years, even though they had already been ordained. This would have to take place if their progress in study was not already known by the consistory. So what can we learn from this call process? Well, there was a lot of preaching. They took the ability to preach very seriously. The consistory was like a board of directors combined with a board of adjudication for a district the size of maybe four circuits. Our district presidents would be equivalent to, um, to superintendents then. There were a lot more checks and controls on the purity of doctrine. There was also a clear program of continuing education and recertification. They did not have to take classes necessarily, but each pastor had to do it and demonstrate progress in his theological study. I also found it interesting that I did not see any requirement for a particular academic degree. So if you had studied on your own, apparently, and you were able to pass those examinations, apparently that was good enough. 
So that's what I found out about the call process at Gerhardt's time. A little different than what we have in um, Missouri Synod. No, they would they would not be ordained, but they would be have some kind of an installation um, and be given some kind of a commissioning, kind of like a vicar. That's that's my sense of, of it. The other thing that um, instead of that diaconate period, a lot of times they would serve as school teachers or tutors. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of a voice does he have? What kind of voice does he have? Is that, is that a pretty narrow understanding? Or does that also include, like, like, does he look you in the eye when he talks to you? Is he socially awkward? Like, is he that kind of Well, it does, it does say, with regard to his preaching, not just looking at whether he can read a text clearly, but whether he is engaging with the people and, and using gestures and things like this. Whether he, in general, has the whole package of a good a good preacher. That's what I do. <laughs> Not that I found. Didn't, I didn't find that, but, you know, maybe if I was to look a little, maybe, you know, maybe there was more to, to it that I didn't find, but the, the, the um, becoming acquainted with the rituals of the church was one of those requirements, it was one of the reasons for having a diaconate period underneath a pastor to, to learn those things. So, and you know, in different regions of Germany, they did have different customs. And so you might have studied in one university with and grown up in one area, but you'd have to go and learn kind of the, the customs of a different region. You said that, that the man would be examined on uh, how his study was coming along. Yeah. Do we have a list of that, what he was required to study? We do. And in fact, I've got a whole other section here that I was, I was going to skip. But if you want me to, <laughs> I'll continue on with it. Is it... Do we use that at all? I mean, is that used in the seminary or? No, nobody knows about this stuff. <laughs> Let me just read it to you. In Gerhardt's district of, this is about visitation. In Gerhardt's district of Coburg, as well as throughout Lutheran Germany in the Reformation and post-Reformation eras, visitations were a regular feature of church life. A visitation was a visit by a church superintendent with assistance to assess the life and ministry of the church's ministers, as well as to deal with issues of church discipline. Just as most working people have to undergo a performance review from time to time, the pastors had to undergo this too. But as we shall see, specific measures were in place to prevent this from being abused by a single person. They did have checks and balances. We tend not to do so well with that. The superintendent alone did not conduct a visitation, but he conducted it with assistance. And the superintendent did not appoint those assistant visitors. The consistory did that. Also, as we shall hear, the visitors assisted the local pastor with church discipline cases. That way, if an excommunication was necessary, it was not, or at least the hope was, that it would not be seen as the obstinate pastor against the congregation. The pastor had backup from the superintendent and visitors, some of whom were laymen, usually lawyers. Gerhardt's church ordinance describes the reasons for the visitation as follows. The reasons for conducting visitations are to maintain the pure teaching of God's word, to maintain the uniformity of church rituals, to maintain ministers in upright conduct and the diligent performance of their office. It is the consistory which furnishes the general superintendent, the specific superintendent, and their assistants with other visitors. So if a specific superintendent is like a bishop, then I guess a general superintendent might be something like an archbishop, but for much smaller um, dioceses than what we would never normally think about. Not just anyone could be a visitor. Visitors had to be God-fearing, honorable men with a real Christian zeal. That's the language that's used there who hold to God's word, the doctrine of the Augsburg Confession, and the Book of Concord, and who have good testimonies or references concerning their doctrine and life. While an annual visitation was seen as impossible, every year ministers were supposed to report complaints to their superintendent. These would include, include cases that needed church discipline as well. 
The examination then, and this is getting to your question, the examination of the church servants and school servants took place on the day before the actual visitation of the parish. By the word Kirchendiener, I, that's the church servant, I take this to mean a minister of the church. A Schuldiener then would be a minister of the school, I suppose. Also, the superintendent should listen to one of the preacher's midweek sermons in a previous week because midweek sermons on the catechism or books of the Bible were standard and usually were required by the church ordinance. Not just one sermon a week. The superintendent should also examine the pastor's sermon outlines. At this time, the superintendent would also admonish the pastor to read not just the Bible, but also diligently to read the symbolical book, the Book of Concord. At each visitation, a book of the Bible and one or two articles of doctrine were assigned to the pastor, and he would be examined on them at the next visitation. This ensured that a lazy pastor would continue studying, and most importantly, that he would study the things that would be most helpful to his people in defending and edifying their faith. The topics for the examination were also not left to the whim of the visitation committee. The church ordinance specified the articles of faith according to which the pastors were to be questioned. And all of this is for uh, parsons, deacons, and all ministers of the church. They were the ones that had to undergo this examination. Parson here is my translation for the German word Pfarrer, which we would call the senior pastor of the parish. So parson and think senior pastor. A deacon then functioned as an assistant pastor and was considered a minister of the church. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that all worked out yet, so don't ask me too many questions on that. Among the questions to be asked, the ministers of the church were asked about their loyalty to the Book of Concord, whether they had been reading the Bible through twice each year. They had to read through the Bible twice each year. Michael Fries likes that, that idea. Whether they have also been reading the symbolical books and Luther's works. They were asked which of the ancient and modern Bible commentators they have been using, and whether they know Greek and Hebrew. The church ordinance explains that Greek and Hebrew were especially important for those who aspire to more advanced service in the church, which makes me wonder and probably think that maybe not all of them had the Greek and Hebrew. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind there too. But Latin was pretty much required for everybody, because with the Latin you had access to all the the Bible commentaries and theological literature of the entire Christian era. Uh, before you get too far away from excommunication, okay. you refer to that as the major band. Mm -hmm. Was that different then by that time from what was understood in Luther's day, a major band being up off? Yeah, yeah. By this time, I think major band would have been, and I'm shooting from the hip here a little bit because I don't have references right here, but I think at this time, major band would be exclusion from the congregation. I don't know whether there were also civil um, civil penalties with that as well. Um, sometimes, you know, a crime would, be, would, would result in both excommunication and civil penalties. Well, that's a good question. I mean, this is temporary suspension. Temporary suspension from the Lord's Supper, I would guess, as opposed to complete exclusion and shunning by the community. I'm guessing there was. I don't, I'm, again, don't ask me too many questions about that because I haven't really looked into that in too much detail. Um, I, I might have another bit on church discipline here. I'm not sure. Well, okay, there were questions that were put to the pastor about his parishioners as well. So not only was the pastor examined, but the parishioners were kind of examined as well. Were the nobility attending church? That was a problem. The nobility tended to not want to attend church, not wanted to deal with and uh, associate with the commoners. Were there rumors of public vices among the parishioners? Were the church ordinances and regulations being respected and maintained? Were parishioners coming to church diligently? And so on. Then there were also questions put to both ministers and parish parishioners on the pastor's sermons and, for example, on whether the ceremonies were being conducted in accord with this church ordinance and in conformity with neighboring pastors. This is kind of a theme. There were questions on the conduct of baptism and of confession, on the conduct of the Holy Supper and on weddings and funerals, questions on salaries and on neighboring pastors. For example, 
did the pastor live at peace and in unity with his neighboring pastors? Then there were questions just for the parishioners. These regarded the pastor's teaching and preaching, catechism instruction, church ceremonies, confession and absolution, how engagements were handled in the parish and visiting the sick. Regarding the ministers of the church, their wives, children, and servants, the parishioners would be asked about their life and conduct, their residences, and salaries. Questions were asked about schools, clerks, sacristans, and sextons in the villages and on the alms chest. After the visitation was over, the superintendent had some further duties, and these duties show how checks and balances were used. The superintendent could not act on his own initiative based on the visitation. He had to submit his report to the consistory and then follow their instruction. As I understand it then, the superintendent was not acting against a minister or parish or parishioner according to his own whim and caprice. Now, what I'm, I'm sorry, I, I misstated that. As I understand it, the superintendent was a, mem- a member of that consistory as well. And so whatever actions were taken by the consistory were, was taken as a group so that you had that check and balance that it wasn't just one guy who didn't like that guy and was taking action against him, but there was a group that was involved with this as well. The the practice of church discipline with the steps of admonition, Matthew 18, were handled or regulated by the consistory. Steps of admonition, of course, are the steps of reconciling a sinning brother from Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, tell him his fault between you and him alone, etc. The way this was handled at Gerhardt's time is that the second step of admonition take uh, one or two with you, would be postponed until the next visitation. So it was kind of uh, regulated. I'm not saying this is a good thing. In fact, there's lots and lots of complaints of that time about how this uh, curtailed or made impossible the the actual functioning of church discipline. Lots of people complained about how this wasn't working well. But anyway, that's how it was. If there were crass, horrible vices, then these should be reported to the civil government. Then the third step of admonition, tell it to the church, belongs to the superintendent and the consistory, according to this, this, uh, this model. So, that is how the ban or excommunication was carried out at that time. It spared the pastor from having to practice church discipline all alone, but it also made the process fairly slow, but steady too. On the other hand, the local congregation and pastor were not in control of it, which could lead to other problems. And so, all through the 19th century, really all from this time all the way through the 19th century, you have everybody complaining about this process. And so uh, not just Walther, but also Wilhelm Lea and a bunch of other people want to place the control of excommunication and church discipline within the congregation, or at least to have some sort of a, a faster process to make it actually function. So you know how sometimes church governments put unreasonable um, requirements in order to carry out a church discipline case, and that basically stalls all church discipline and nothing happens. I think we know that. I think we know how that works. The church ordinance makes explicit that in the case of crass manifest sins, these steps of admonition from Matthew 18 do not have to be followed. The secular government with the consistory makes the call here because this refers to secular crimes. Conflicts sometimes arise between pastors, so the church ordinance deals with that as well. There is a limit to the visitor's and consistory's authority, though. Only what is well known may be judged by the visitors, quote, since the church does not give judgment on hidden things. Also, unproved accusations must be ignored, and has been, as has been noted, judgment is never the responsibility of one man alone. It is always exercised here by a committee. This way, the whim of a single man, hopefully, cannot do much harm and is also not subject to the judgment of an uncatechized population. In a visitation, not all the parishioners were supposed to be present. In cities, only the officials and the city council would be questioned in the visitation. In villages, only the leading laymen and officers were to be present. Records were kept on each pastor and parish, as well as records of baptisms, marriages, and deaths. And finally, just as the specific superintendents conducted a visitation of the parishes in his district, the general superintendent conducted a visitation of his specific superintendents. So that would be as if 
you know, the circuit, um, maybe circuit visitor, if he was the specific superintendent, the district president would be visiting his parish as well to make sure and, you know, making sure these things are all happening as they should. Uh, not just the district president, but with the, with the committee. The last section here on this part deals with the territorial prince as the head of the church. As we have seen, the pious magistrate, the Christian prince, was essentially the head of the church in Lutheran Germany. In German, this is called the Landesherrliche Kirchenregiment, church governance by the territorial lord. The entire history of the Lutheran Church, from Luther on down to the 19th century, is one in which Lutheran pastors strove to gain authority over against the government to be able to fulfill their ministry in accord with Scripture. When the magistrate was indeed pious, all was well, and the Lutheran theologians were very happy to have his help. But as often happened in history, the princes were not always so pious. Many of them neglected the church. Others lived openly sinful lives, and others of them changed confessions and tried to change the churches in their lands into reformed churches. The practice of church government by the territorial lord may have been exercised unofficially going back into the Middle Ages. And as I've mentioned, by Luther's time, most of the bishops were from the nobility and acted like secular princes anyway. In the Lutheran Church, the practice of church government by the territorial lord began officially with the 1527 visitation of churches in electoral Saxony with Luther and Melanchthon. Luther wanted that to be seen as an exercise of Christian love with the secular power being used only to prevent sedition and turmoil. But Elector John saw it simply as an exercise of his power. Gerhardt then, in in his commonplace on the church, attempted to limit the authority of the secular government within the church. Alongside the prince, he placed the ministerium and the people as necessarily having an equal role in the call process. So against absolutist claims by the secular prince, Gerhardt emphasized the rights of the whole church, which is more than the prince. So with that as background, I think we should see the continued assertions of pastoral rights and privileges from the 16th and 17th centuries not as self-aggrandizement over against the laity, but as attempts by pastors to gain freedom from state control to carry out their ministry in accord with Scripture. So Gerhardt's church ordinance on the call process and visitation will not be able to be applied to our North American situation without major editing. But by examining this, we have been able to see first what Gerhardt considered to be a faithful application of the doctrines of church and ministry. Second, we've seen how various checks and balances were used in order to uphold quality and fidelity in Lutheran ministry. And third, we've seen wisdom applied to the structures of church government in order to avoid misuse and capriciousness by individuals. So that's the end of that section. Does anybody have any questions, or does any of this strike you as surprising? Um, You you talked about um, uh, pastors having to serve as a a teacher for a period of time. Do you think uh, that had anything to do with the title that we give to Lutheran school teachers as commission ministers? Well, um, that's a difficult question, and and again, it's not one that I'm really prepared to, to answer. I've not yet really been able to narrow down and figure out what was the status, the ecclesiastical status of school teachers at, at the time of the Reformation as well as after that. Um, they are, you know, you've got Kirchendiener, these servants of the church, and you've got Schuldiener, servants of the school. Um, and it was a lot of times it was a, a theological candidate who had already studied Greek, Hebrew, theological studies. A lot of times he would serve as a teacher for a while before being called and ordained to a parish. So I haven't figured out the exact ecclesiastical status of these folks, but my sense is that they did not receive a call at that time. I mean, they were part of a vocation, just like a lot of different vocations, but it wasn't like an ecclesiastical call as far as I've been able to see. More like an appointment and installation. You mentioned uh, the 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that, uh, bound by the seal, but then sounds like they're being recorded. Well, I think by crass, they're, they're talking about manifest crimes, things that are well known, you know. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You, you talked about these superintendents and visitors, and you said that a certain percentage of the visitors were white, you know, lawyers. Yeah. And the balance then would have been clergy themselves. Yeah. And if so, did they have their own parishes, or was this their full time occupation? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure on that. My, my sense, though, is that when Gerhardt was doing all of these things, he was probably um, at least one of the pastors at a congregation and would have, would have had regular preaching duties there. And uh, you've got a, an answer to that? No. Okay. Well, then, my, my sense is that he would have had regular preaching duties at, at a congregation, whether that would have been, the you know, whether he had the main care of souls at that congregation or whether or not. My guess is that probably not. He was probably one of the preachers at a congregation. So I believe you said in your introduction last night that uh, Walter would have been familiar with care. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have evidence that he would have been familiar with these types of church uh, structure documents? And if so, what was his process then in developing the structure in North America? Yeah, that's that goes way beyond what I'm trying to do here today, and I'm, I'm not really able to answer that. But the I will say this: that the entire history of Lutheranism in the 19th century is the struggle to figure out how to be be the church outside of the territorial church, how, how to be and govern oneself as the Lutheran Church and not have a state-sponsored, um, you know, salary structure, discipline structure, and all of those sorts of things. So. Walther has one particular way of doing this that he feels is the most faithful to um, Luther. Although, as we saw, Luther was very much a part of this this uh, this rise of the territorial the Landesherrliche Kirchenregiment. So, I don't have a good answer for you there, but that that's just part of that nineteenth century struggle. Yeah, uh, so I suppose. say that it definitely was seen as being part of the church. Whether it was the Ecclesia Representativa or not, I'm not sure. I just haven't looked into that. But um, but the sense was definitely that, you know, you find this with Gerhardt when it says, tell it to the church. That means tell it to the consistory. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that for Gerhardt, and I think for all the Lutherans from Luther on on until Walther's time, thought of the church in terms of the regional church. And it's the regional church that they really are talking about when they say our church teaches this or that. They're not necessarily they're not they're probably not talking about 
you know, St. Paul's congregation in Kiwani. They're talking about, you know, the, the central Illinois district. Okay. All right. Um, maybe one last question, then we'll launch into something else. We've got how much time? We've got like 40 minutes still. Oh, you've got a question? Mm -hmm. Not entirely in point, but in every surgeon's direct, the viscidus survived in some of the areas of Scandinavia. Yes. And there, what was unique about them is that, you know, you had the Roman Catholic clergy that were forced by the king to become Lutheran. And, um, and, and then after that, you know, were they nobles at that time? Well, what you, had, what you then had happen was, in fact, some of those bishops in the Scandinavian countries actually were decent theologians and weren't just, po weren't just political players. So, you know, you, we've got this book that just came out from uh, Concordia Publishing House called Lives and Writings of the Great Fathers of the Lutheran Church. And one of the guys that, that's in that book is Johannes Rudbeckius, a sweet, Swedish bishop. He had been a teacher and done some other things, but... Um, in, in the writing that I translated for that particular chapter, he's talking about how he's trying to like limit the power of the king in the, in the call process. And that's how a lot of times these struggles, these struggles went. You see this with Gerhardt as well, where they are, um, they're trying to give, they're trying to avoid what a lot of the lawyers were claiming at the time that the, that the prince had all, you know, absolute power over the church. And they're making the theological arguments that not just the, the, Prince, but also the the clergy and the people are the church as well, and so you see this with some of these Swedish bishops as well. But I, I've not found from, and this is just an argument from silence. But I, from the 16th and 17th century, I've not found much that uh, of Swedish bishops claiming an apostolic succession as being of any great importance. Um, and if somebody finds that, please let me know. Um, but. You know, this, what I read from this uh, Johannes Rudbeckius guy, it's, you know, he takes his role as a bishop very seriously, but um, it's not that, the apostolic succession part is not, not pronounced anyway. Okay. <clears throat> now we want to talk about what this conference is all about, which is why the call is necessary before functioning as a minister of word and sacraments. In the LCMS, we speak of the ministry as either the office of the holy ministry or the office of the public ministry. Gerhardt's preferred way to speak of this is the ecclesiastical ministry, that is, the ministry that is for the church and in the church and within Christ's body, the church. For Gerhardt, public ministry is not a suitable term for this. Public ministry is a general term, not just for churchly service, but also for political office. Remember that in Romans 13.4, the ruler is, quote, God's minister to you for good. It is called public because it benefits the people or the public. Even to this day, high-ranking officials in the secular government of the United Kingdom and Germany are called ministers. And uh, when I was an exchange student in Germany, they had one of the students, uh, one of the student officers was the, the, uh, the beer minister. And there was a papier minister and, and others like this. And the funny thing was, is that that didn't necessarily raise a, a chuckle from people because it was just kind of seen as the person who's in charge of providing the beer or providing the paper or what have you. <laughs> well, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the word minister in, for, for Gerhardt uh, was broader than what we would consider a, a churchly minister. It could also be a, a, a civil, secular kind of a position. But it also was a, it was always a position uh, with official duties. So, so, so besides minister, deaner, I don't know, Knecht would be a slave or a servant of, of that sort. Uh -huh. I'm sorry if you already addressed this. You alluded earlier, and I wasn't sure if you made it clear elsewhere, uh, but the, the deacon, um, just goes back to the first section, uh, was that, were they typically those who were preparing for the office of presbyter then? Or 
because you made the distinction between the um, bishop, the, the presbyterian, and the deacon, yeah. which struck me as a little odd because they served, they assisted with the administration of the sacrament, but then they, they didn't preach. Or, I mean, no, 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 and I'm not exactly sure. I haven't done enough um, research on this to be able to answer you really well. I can tell you that um, Georg Röhrer was ordained in 1525 in Wittenberg to be the deacon of the church, of the parish church in, in Wittenberg. And what were his duties? It certainly involved preaching. So it was what we would consider. And he had, you know, he had a full theological education. Um, he was called to that. He was ordained with the laying on of hands by Luther, um, and as well as by Melanchthon and some others. They were kind of still figuring things out. Um, and so it, it, it's, not, it's what I would consider a call to be an assistant pastor. But I'm not sure whether it included sacramental duties, such as being celebrant and distributing this, the, the Lord's Supper and baptism. I think it probably did, but I'm not sure. So that's all I can say on that. I, have, I need to do more work on that. Um. In the Wolferinus correspondence, there's the deacon that distributes the sacrament and consumes the chalice at the end of the distribution, Okay. but himself doesn't commune. Oh, okay. That right. was the flap, right? Okay. So, there you go. All right. Gerhard does not use public ministry as a synonym for the ecclesiastical ministry. Public ministry is broader. So the ecclesiastical ministry is more specific, and therefore I think I would suggest that we too should adopt this language and avoid the ambiguous public ministry language. Now before, yeah, before we talk about the call to the ecclesiastical ministry, we should talk about whether there actually is such a thing as the ecclesiastical ministry. Gerhardt makes an interesting argument here. His argument is that since there are divine promises for the preservation of the church until the end of time, the same promises speak also of the preservation of the ecclesiastical ministry until the end of time. For example, Isaiah 59.21 speaks of both the preservation of the church and of the ministry. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. And he sees that as, a, as proof for the existence of the ministry. This argument is based on the nature of the church. Gerhardt writes, You see, because the church is called out of the world, gathered, governed, enlarged, nourished, and spread through the word, the preservation of the church certainly includes the preservation of the word and of the ecclesiastical ministry, which is the ministry of the word and of the spirit. Romans 10, 14 through 15, But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? But how shall they preach unless they are sent? That is, the church as a creation of the word of God necessarily pre-requires the ministry by which that word of God is preached and taught. The word as it is preached and taught, then, is prior to the gathering of the church by that preached and taught word. So wherever we have descriptions in, in Scripture of the word gathering people together, that pre-requires a preacher. In proving that there is an ecclesiastical ministry, Gerhardt shows that from the time of the patriarchs in the Old Testament, there has always been an ecclesiastical ministry established by divine command. At the time of the patriarchs, the firstborn sons performed the priesthood by divine command. Later, Moses transferred the priesthood to the tribe of Levi by God's command, quote, so that no one except those who would come from that tribe performed the priesthood. This arrangement lasted until Christ. Christ taught, but did not take for himself any political office or function, showing that the distinction of the ecclesiastical ministry is one that's distinct, so the ecclesiastical ministry is distinct from political rulers. Then Christ sent the apostles as his ambassadors, and currently he gives shepherds and teachers to his church, Ephesians 4, 11. When Gerhardt proves that there is an ecclesiastical ministry, what he's doing is showing that there is a distinction in duties between ministers and the rest of the members of the church. 
One way that he shows this is by citing God's threats and judgments against those who usurp ministerial functions without a divine call. Now here he's not really proving, he's not, he's not yet trying to prove that lay people should not take up the ecclesiastical, fun, the, uh, the, the word, you know, to uh, publicly proclaim the word and, and, his, and uh, distribute the sacraments. He's just trying to show that there is a distinction. He writes, Finally, God's serious complaint about those who run but were not sent, Jeremiah 23, 21, and his threat to punish those who thrust themselves into this office without a call, as well as the punishment inflicted by God on those who presumed to usurp a function of the ministry without a call, 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings 13, 2 Samuel 6, 2 Chronicles 26. I say all these reveal clearly that this duty is distinct from the other orders of the church. The other orders then would be what? Do you know? The three orders of the church. Domestic and civil. Okay, so for Gerhardt, it's civil magistrate, clergy, so the ministerium and the people. It's a little different than how Gerhardt ta- or than how Luther takes the three estates. For for Luther, you can be in more than one estate at a time. You you know, in there's the churchly estate in which there are both preachers and hearers, domestic estate where there are fathers and mothers and children, servants and others, and the civil estate where you've got rulers and subjects. Uh, for Gerhardt, he takes them as three parts of the church, which is different. So just to clarify on that point then, um, so, so for Gerhardt, the estates are actual offices that would be held by specific people rather than just realms. Right, right. And the reason that he makes that, as I explained earlier, was in order to try to carve out a place for the, the ministry and the people in the call process and in the governance of the church so that it wasn't an absolutist um, civil, uh, civil you know, prince ruling the church and making all the decisions. But it is different than Luther, and it's important to keep that in mind. Oh, Gerhardt goes on, you see, wherever there is a particular calling, there is also a particular duty that is committed to certain people by that calling. So let's unpack those Bible passages. Jeremiah 23, 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. 1 Kings 13, 11 through 24 is the story of the man of God sent by God from Judah to Bethel, who disobeyed his commission. He ate with the prophet of Bethel, and was killed by a lion. 2 Samuel 6, 6 6-7 is where God killed Uzzah for taking hold of the Ark of the Covenant when the oxen stumbled, when David was bringing the Ark up to Jerusalem. And 2 Chronicles 26, 18 is the account of King Uzziah's usurpation of priestly ministerial functions. It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. In all of these examples, there are individuals or groups who have a distinct calling with a distinct duty given by God. As Gerhardt explains it, this shows that the ecclesiastical ministry is distinct from other orders that God had commanded, such as the estate of political rulers. They also show something very interesting here, and that is that for Gerhardt, the office of priest, with a call that comes from God through human beings, immediate call, and the office of prophet, with a call that comes directly from God, an immediate call, are instantiations of the ecclesiastical ministry. And therefore, God's way of dealing with them in the Old Testament has doctrinal content for the ecclesiastical ministry in the New Testament church. Now, some people might say that the Old Testament priesthood has no bearing on the New Testament ecclesiastical ministry, since it pointed forward not to a special ministry, but to the priesthood of all believers. Yet Gerhardt shows that in the Old Testament, there was a punishment imposed by God for those who assumed the priesthood without a call. This shows that Old Testament priests are the counterpart, not of the priesthood of all believers, but of the special ecclesiastical ministry. You see why? Because God never punishes anyone for becoming one of his royal priests. He wants all people to be believers, to be saved.
He calls everyone to this general royal priesthood. And so therefore, when a specific priesthood is spoken of in the Old Testament with punishments for people who take it up, that cannot point forward to the general priesthood of all believers. Gerhardt is able rightly to see the Old Testament priests as examples of an ecclesiastical ministry that is distinct from the position of the people of God, the royal priesthood of all believers. And it should be pointed out also that on Mount Sinai in Exodus 20, or was it 19, God speaks of the whole people of Israel as being his royal priestly people. So there's the, the, the general priesthood of all believers and of the people of God is in both Testaments. And the specific priesthood in the Old Testament pointed forward and has doctrinal content for the ecclesiastical ministry in the New Testament, not for the priesthood of all believers. Make sense? To this crowd. Can I actually ask a question on that? Um, Fritz was looking at me when he said to some people. <laughs> um, I, that, I've noticed, you know, that that kind of that that uh, that way of arguing before, you know, from from other dogmaticians that they'll. You know, to, like in, in Hebrews, it says, you know, Aaron did not take this for himself, you know, but was called. And it seems like, you know, the, the issue that the Lutherans have with the Roman Catholics on the, the ministry being the continuation of the Levitical priesthood um, is more so with uh, centered around kind of the um, the understanding of of a sacrifice, right? Um, so, so I mean, would, would this be sort of like Gerhard is showing here that there's this basic doctrine on the call that's taught throughout the scriptures, and this doesn't mean that the New Testament ministry is the same thing as the, the Levitical or just kind of you know updated Levitical priesthood, right. but the doctrine of the call um, is the same, right? So. Yes, that's that's a good way of putting it. So just because Gerhardt is able to see the Old Testament priests as examples of the ecclesiastical ministry, which applies to the New Testament time as well, that doesn't mean that everything that applied to the Old Testament priests also applies to New Testament ministers, especially especially not the sacrifice issue with, with regard to the Lord's Supper being a sacrifice. There are other priestly aspects of sacrifice that are part of the... Um, the, the pastoral office in the New Testament. Um, but I think our confessions say the exact same thing. Is there anything that you're aware of where he speaks to the um, question of whether the priests, the Aaronic priests, were simply doing their duties on behalf of all the people who all had the ability to do, you know, like like we view it in Missouri Synod. Well, some of us. Anyway. I, have, I haven't found that. You haven't found that? I haven't found it, but... You know, doesn't mean it's not there, but I just haven't found it. Well, so for those of us who think that it's not there, we haven't found it either. Huh? Okay. <clears throat> Although Gerhardt normally views the Old Testament priests as either foreshadowing Christ in sacrificing or ministers of the church in being called by God, set apart, and ministering the word and blessing to people, Gerhardt, in one marginal note, does draw a parallel between Old Testament priests and New Testament lay people. So... He, this is where he says, just as all the priests were allowed to investigate leprosy and to, well, maybe this is kind of disproving what you had just said. Just as all the priests were allowed to investigate leprosy and to pass judgment on uncleanness or healing, so also every devout person in the New Testament should be allowed to console a neighbor terrified by sin with the word of the gospel and to announce to him the forgiveness of sins since all are spiritual priests. But that's not the conclusion he normally draws from the Acts of Old Testament priests. And it is also one of these marginal notes that he kind of scribbled on the side of, of his copy and that were then later put into the text by his, uh, by his son in a later edition, a posthumous edition. So that's not normally the way that he, that he argues on these texts. But you, gotta, you have to be careful bef before saying something like, Gerhard never said this or that, you know. There are two basic challenges to the doctrine of the ministry in our day. First, some say the ministry is unnecessary. And second, some say that while some function of ministering is necessary, a specific divine call is not necessary for this. 
That first objection is made by enthusiasts, old and new. And by enthusiasts here, I mean those who seek divine revelation within their hearts and see the written and preached word of God as unnecessary or useless. The classic example of an extreme position of enthusiasm would be the Quakers, Society of Friends, whose religious services did not include preaching, but only awaiting to be inspired by a spirit, believed by them to be the Holy Spirit. Gerhardt responds to the enthusiasts, Arguments, such as Isaiah 54, 13, they will all be taught by God. Gerhardt uh, responds by proving the necessity of the external means of grace for salvation. Since the necessity of the means of grace for salvation falls outside the scope of our study, we'll skip Gerhardt's arguments here. But we should notice that Gerhardt transitions fluidly between the concrete sense of ministry as the duty to preach God's word and administer the sacraments, committed not to all the church, but to a specific order of men within the church, and the functional abstract sense of ministry as ministration, or as the function of preaching God's word. That That is to say, to prove that there is an ecclesiastical ministry, he showed the institution of the order of patriarchs, priests, prophets, apostles, and bishop presbyters. But then to prove its necessity, he shows the necessity of the means of grace. Why? Because the ecclesiastical ministry exists for the sake of performing the functions of preaching and teaching the word and of administering the sacraments. The order of persons and the functions are a unity. You can see this unity of function and ministerial office-bearing person when Gerhardt says, God could convert and save humans without the ministry of the word and sacraments. Their functional, you know, ministration of the word and sacraments. But it pleased his wisdom to deal with us not directly, but through the word and sacraments, which he committed, and he committed the stewardship of these mysteries to the ministers of his church. Okay, so what I was trying to show there is that there is this unity between the function of the ministries Uh, the function of the ministrations that the pastors do and those ministers themselves. Um, Would this, would this have a connection between when, when he, when he would talk about like the call being necessary as a mandate and then ordination being necessary for decorum or for good order. So like the actual order then so the fact that the call is just the the the, uh, the existence of the ministry uh, of the preaching of the gospel, and uh, but then the order or the decorum or the good order is I mean, we used to, we usually think a good order is just purely pragmatic whatever works, but it seems like this good order is actually there's a rhyme and reason to it. There's an actual order that he has established. Um, would that would that so would that have that connection then between the the call being necessary by God's mandate. I think it's a different. Or, I think it's a different question. That's a different question. Um, I'm not going to get into ordination too much. I will say this: that for Gerhardt, ordination is not an uh, adiaphoron, but it's part of the call process. But the or, the laying on of hands, which is a ceremony that goes with ordination, that could that could be seen as an adiaphoron. Or not an adiaphron, but as a ceremony that is not necessarily part of of ordination, but the ordination really has to do more with the giving of commands to carry out the um, the duties of the ministry. So I suppose just to kind of rephrase my question then, just when you know you mentioned the necessity, the actual order right of of uh, of, of the minister is is looked at in, in light of the necessity of the means of grace. I suppose how we would see it, you know, how people would argue today is that, well, it's necessary that that, that someone preach. So somebody's got to do it. And so it's almost it's taken in this kind of, you know, whatever works kind of way. But he seems to be saying, well, no, he's arguing actually, he's kind of tr- seems to be turning it on his head and arguing that, no, actually, this affirms the necessity then of the ministry. Yeah, yeah, that's... Okay, that's a good good way of putting it, yeah. Let's go on. So we've been discussing the existence and the necessity of the ministry. No one disputes that there are pastors today who carry out some function of ministering. The question has always been whether it was God who established this ministry. 
Gerhardt's proofs up to now have shown not just that there were always ministers carrying out a ministry, but that it was God who set this up. In Gerhardt's words, the efficient cause of the ecclesiastical ministry is God the Holy Trinity. An efficient cause is the one who brings it about or makes it happen. Gerhardt gives several proofs of this, but I think the most interesting is the exhortations to ask God for shepherds. Christ commands us in Matthew 9.38 to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into his harvest. In Acts, the church prayed when pastors were going to be selected. So if pastors, that is shepherds, are what God commands us to pray for, then he must be the one who grants this request. Therefore, he is the giver or the efficient cause of the ecclesiastical ministry. Therefore, the ministry has been set up by God. Beautiful. The other very interesting proof that God is the efficient cause of the ministry comes from John 20, 21 through 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's a controverted text in our midst, I think we can say. Normally, when Luther preached on this text, he spoke of absolution, often mentioning that any layman can do this if a minister of the church is unavailable. You can see his sermons in Luther's Works 69. Gerhardt sees it as more than this. He sees this text, along with Matthew 28 and Mark 16, as Christ's committing of the ministry to the apostles. From John 20, specifically, the Holy Spirit and his gifts are connected to the ecclesiastical ministry. Gerhardt writes, The ministry of the gospel is also called the ministry of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.6, not only because the Holy Spirit is given through the word of the gospel, Galatians 3.2, but also because the Holy Spirit is the author and preserver of the ministry and equips ministers with the necessary gifts. Thus, when Christ wished to commit the ministry to his apostles, he first gave them the Holy Spirit by means of breathing on them, John 20, 22. The result is that all ministers of the church do correctly and salutarily in their office. Okay, let me back up. All that ministers of the church do correctly and salutarily in their office is correctly attributed to the Holy Spirit, who acts effectually in them and through them. Matthew 10, 20 for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Note here that John 20, 22 is being applied not to laity, but to the apostles and the ministers of the church today. Also, the text speaks of committing the ministerial duty to the apostles and equipping them with the special gifts of the Holy Spirit for their ministry. And all of those items taken together according to Gerhardt, show that God is the one who established the ecclesiastical ministry and that he has entrusted the giving of the necessary saving gospel and sacraments to ministers of the church. How, mu how long do, you, do we want to go? About three minutes. If you got, is this a good stopping place? It is a good stopping place. Okay, well, I do have a question, okay. so maybe we can do that quickly. I'm wondering, and maybe you'll deal with this later. But I'm wondering, since there seems to be a distinction between Gerhard and Luther on forgiving sins, is there also a distinction between them on the question of what is the office of the keys? Is that equivalent to the office of the ministry for Gerhard, whereas perhaps not for Luther? I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Well, uh, we'll maybe talk about that later. In the, your discussion about the, the priesthood, Old Testament to New Testament, does Gerhard only see the connection there in terms of the, the call and the distinction between ministers and laity? Or like, could you also see with Gerhard other um, fig, prefigurements in vestments and liturgical ritual um. well i went by it pretty quickly but the main the main continuities that he sees are the teaching function of the old testament priests which is kind of understated in the old testament but i think it's there um the praying aspect and the blessing aspect 
Um, but the sacrificing aspect of the Old Testament priests points to Christ and not to the New Testament ministers. So that's the way that he takes it.